we're here. I think we can do this really quickly tonight. So I know, because I know everybody. Make a motion to adjourn the meetings. No. You said anyway. Well, I think no. I, I think we're I think we're going to be we're going to be good. Um, welcome. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to look at the camera. Uh, meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, we should do the introductions. Would you like to start? Of course. James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Kent Schatz, uh, Department for Children and Families. Rebecca Turner, Defender General's Office. Jessica Brown, Chittenden County Public Defender Office. David Chair, Attorney General's Office. Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Jeff Jones. Uh, Chief Don Stevens, I'll leave you in the IT tribe. Monica Weaver, Department of Corrections. And Gary Scott, State Police. Eitan Ness, Red and Longo, Chair. Um, the announcements are pretty simple. Uh, Sheila can't make it tonight and really is begging, as I think you all saw, that we not have meetings on the fourth Tuesday of the month anymore. I really didn't want to have this happen. As you all know, it was, you know, that nasty substance known as sleep. Um, and uh, Rick Gothier can't make it, and Ingrid Jonas can't make it. Those are the people who I've heard from. I haven't heard from anybody else, so um, we're here. Uh, any other announcements? Well, you gave us a bunch. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Just a lot of things going on. Yeah. Good things. Very good things. Anything else that anybody has? I had, that was all I had. Okay. Um, let's move on to the minutes. I sent them out to you. I know 26 February seems like, I don't know, there were Neanderthal at that point in time <laughs> running about. Um, I, I barely can remember that one. Um, but 12 March I still have in my head. So why don't we start with 26 February? Does anyone have any addenda or changes or anything of that nature for those minutes for the 26th of February? No, I move that we, uh... Okay, second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All abstentions? They, they can't, as, as we have at, at oh God, I can't talk tonight. They're fine. <laughs> Thank you. March 12th. Those were the ones that uh, Pepper did for us, which I'm going to be relying heavily upon when I start to come up with something that we can all tear apart. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, That's a good conversation. Any, again, changes, addenda, comments? Someone like to move that we, I'll move. great, someone second. Once again, Gary seconds. All in favor of passing, of uh, approving this agenda, or minutes, these minutes? Aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> All abstaining? Do I have to abstain if I wasn't here? I wasn't there. You weren't there, yeah. sure, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, they are as submitted. Thank you, approved. Um, moving right along, brief discussion. I, I, we did this last time. Uh, of, of acts that, or bills that were sort of on our purview. Um, you'll remember last time we talked about, oh God, I can't remember the numbers, um, but you remember we were talking about, um, I don't know what's in here someplace, H381, an act relating to racial impact statements, and we talked about that last time. So there are actually two here. I don't have the second one on the agenda. But um, the first one is H460, which you have a copy of right now, um, an act relating to sealing and expungement of criminal history records. Um, again, this is something that, as you all know, we've been talking about um, as something that we would want to put in recommendations in the report. So I thought we should talk about it. I am grateful to Pepper, who brought it to my attention. 
And then also, because he's going to talk about it. <laughs> so take it over. Sure. <clears throat> so this uh, bill relates to expunging of criminal records, H-460. Um, it's the product of work over the summer with my office, the Attorney General's office, the uh, Court Administrator's office, and the Defender General's office. And the original charge from the legislature was to think about uh, adding to the list of crimes that can be expunged um, felony drug possession crimes. And so if you'll see on, currently, just so everyone's clear, uh, felonies except for four of them are not expungement eligible. Um, so adding felony drug possession crimes is a somewhat significant step forward for the legislature. Um, but uh, if you look on page two and three, you'll see all the drug possession crimes that have been added to expungement eligibility. And just so everyone's aware, um, the other criteria, I mean, to be expungement eligible, you have to have a qualifying crime. You have to wait five years from the completion of your sentence. You have to pay, have paid all restitution um, and court fees and all the rest. And um, you have to have no intervening crimes in between the time of your completed sentence and that during that five-year waiting period. So um, this um, adds drug possession crimes. It adds a number of crimes that um, are generally what we determine to be associated with uh, drug substance use disorder. Um, for instance, conspiracy to receive stolen property, property false personation, false pretenses, um, really, uh, receiving stolen property. Um, I know that the House added um, kind of uttering forged instruments, which is kind of like writing bad checks or taking someone else's check and signing for it and taking it. Um, uh, the Senate has also now added um, DUI 1 um, to sealing eligibility. And um, I mean, that's basically what this does. There's some technical changes as to um, what the court actually, what requirements are placed upon the court when someone is granted an expungement. There's some changes to the effect of the sealing. Um, and it also eliminates fees if you're filing an expungement petition. Normally there's a $90 fee associated with filing a petition for expungement. The courts are allowed to waive that fee, um, but this just eliminates it altogether, which okay. is probably the right thing to do from a policy standpoint. I mean, you know. Sunday's 90 is a lot of money. Right. And, and there's been some inconsistent treatment as to whether it's $90 per petition or per charge, or if you have charges in multiple counties, you pay the $90 once, or you have to pay it uh, for each petition. Um, so, I, you know, just kind of in a way to simplify and kind of provide, a, you know, more fairness, and um, the fee was just eliminated. Okay. Um, anything you want to add, David? No, that was a good summary of where we are, yeah. Can, I, I, this may be a matter of my own density, but did you, did you, is it in here what the requirements for expungement are? It's probably Did I miss not that? in here, but if you look up 13 VSA 7603, okay. that is the section of law which describes how you get an expungement or a sealing. Okay. And it explains um, what steps are required before you can petition. Okay. All right, I will do that. Thank you. So that would talk about how you go to the courthouse or some or whatever. Is it like online or? Well, no, it, it actually, uh, what that does is sets up the criteria that makes you eligible for a expungement. Um, as far as getting one, I mean, I think people have probably heard about expungement clinics that our state's mm -hmm. attorneys have been holding around the state where um, you need to run a background check. There's a fee associated with that. So at the expungement clinics, we've been waiving those background check fees and we've, have it, we've been having our state's attorneys, if you're eligible for an expungement, help fill out the paperwork and then, you know, and then try and waive the $90 fee also. There's kind of a way to do that. But uh, okay. um, it's not spelled out explicitly how to do it. You have to be somewhat you know, savvy with the criminal justice system to understand how to file that petition. Um, so you know, one thing that has always been talked about in the legislature is trying to figure out a way to automate that process. And automation is a bad term for that because um, 
there's always going to have to be people reviewing the application and doing the work of actually expunging the record. So we've been trying to shift the thinking to a petitionless system where the individual who um, has the criminal record doesn't have to actually fill out the petition. It's it's automatically generated on the part of the state's attorney, and then they review it, and then they can object. Or, um, but that's kind of a conversation that's been happening um, with respect to kind of what technology is required in order to do that. It reminds me of the complications of this that you're sort of getting at, that people that you were just saying it requires a certain amount of savvy. I was remembering, I think it was you, Rebecca, who brought up at the last meeting the issue of <laughs> having like know your rights trainings yeah. and such. And that seems like yet more ammunition for putting that in our recommendations that some we might need to do, put that forward to the legislature in the report is that that kind of thing has to happen. Um, particularly with something that's this labyrinth. Yeah. And if you look at what we call just informally the uptake rate of expungement, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the known universe of convictions that are expungement eligible, and then you look at how many people are actually applying for expungements, mm -hmm. it's less than 1%. So, ah, okay. So, I mean, that kind of just it's, highlights yeah. the idea that uh, not a lot of people know about expungement and the and Maybe even if you know about it, you think, well, do I apply? I'm not going to go through that. Right. Or maybe it's the $90 fee or, you know, there's lots of hurdles in the, in the right. way. Yeah. So maybe that would be more. Anyway, I just wanted to put that out there, the, just to make a tie back to our last meeting. Um, anything else? That I would just add that we're in the process of rolling out a new case management system um, oh. over the next two years. Um, and as we do that, I hope hopefully it will become easier for uh, people to access that information and right. process those requests for expungement. But um, I would have to echo uh, Pepper's comments. I, I don't think it will ever really be automatic mm -hmm. in the sense that it's up to the state's attorney to, uh, there are different pieces that different folks have to do. They're, they're, right now, for instance, there's one statute that speaks to petition list, but it has a two-step process, and that is that the Department of Corrections has to tell us that the person has served their sentence, whatever it is. Right. We don't get that information, and I don't know that they can provide it to us. Um, so it requires someone to determine, first of all, whether this person has served their sentence. Their restitution is a, a condition of, of expungement. And, uh, so there are different parts. Right. Of, the conviction is one piece of it. There are other parts that somebody usually has to verify that they have been complied with. Okay. And it's not the court's obligation to do that. Who are the case managers going? Are, 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 are literally social workers, LICSWs, or what do you mean? Well, when you say case manager, I immediately go into social work. Case management work. system. The oh, I'm sorry, case manager. It's an electronic filing system. Oh, in other words, going forward. Not a human at all. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so everything will have to be filed electronically. Okay. Obviously, if you're self-represented, you can still file on paper. But right. I think as more people just live on the internet, they will yes. come to I'm still the old. I think there are humans involved. <laughs> the only other piece I would add, just a <clears throat> resource piece for us, uh, or somebody we can look to, Vermont Legal Aid has been, in addition to the state's attorney, Vermont Legal Aid has been doing a huge amount of work on this and dedicated some serious resources to holding expungement clinics around the state. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but somebody that we could point to or look to as an example. That would be great. People have provided a lot of... Uh, know your rights type of materials. Mm -hmm. They've got a whole web page that explains how to do expungements. And just in terms of the, I mean, they've probably driven the expungement rate up by some significant percentage by okay. themselves. So somebody we can point to. So we can point to the resource. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're taking minutes, could you? I won't have that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question that if, if these, if we're looking at supporting this and there's a process for expungement. Wouldn't it make sense that we would recommend also that 
for crimes of these natures, if they meet certain criteria, that they would be looked to do maybe court diversion or something so they don't even become into the system, that there might be some, if they meet the certain, uh, whatever it is, court diversion, and then it wouldn't, they would be, you know, they wouldn't even get a record. I, I don't know if I'm yeah. asking the question. It's a great point, and maybe you want to speak about Tamarack a little bit. Sure. Yeah, no, it is a good point, and it's been a huge subject of discussion and activity over the last couple of years. So a couple points to make. One is that for expungement-eligible misdemeanors right now, there is a presumption that those crimes should be put into diversion or those charges should be put into diversion um, unless the state's attorney objects and they have to provide a reason why they're objecting. Um, the second piece is that for these drug fuel, I should say, substance use disorder fuel defenses, there's a new program under uh, the AGO umbrella uh, that's called the Tamarack Program, and it's kind of like diversion. It's sort of legally speaking in the diversion statute, but it's really more of a treatment type of program, getting people connected with mental health resources, substance abuse resources. So there actually has been a huge uh, push on that. and. Uh, We've seen very large increases in the numbers of people. It's still too early, though, to know yet about results and efficacy because it just got instituted in 2017. But you, you, it's a good point. So they're working on, they're yeah, working on yeah, that. Yeah, right yeah. A lot of activity yeah. happening. This, this bill will likely correct kind of historic crimes. T Tamarack's only been around right. for two years. Right. So uh, um, I would say a lot of these drug possession crimes would most likely be going to the, a diversion style program at this point. And that goes in line with misdemeanor thefts too, right? If they have some type of nexus to the, like they steal an item but it's led to. That's exactly right. So yeah, Tamarack might well be appropriate as opposed to regular diversion, original diversion for that type of activity too, when people know that it's really related to some that's that's issue. issue. That's something that came up last time, Jeff, we were talking about sort of a theft of Nike sneakers. They take the totality of the circumstances when they bring them in and try to figure out where the best place to put that person so they're not getting them necessarily from all record. Your Honor, yeah, I can't remember where I parked my car. I know. <laughs> 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 uh, anything else that... Um, something I this yep. is totally sideways, but I would like to take advantage of the wisdoms is at this table. Um, just because in the last couple of days I've had a number of questions about two particular arrests, one for joints in a pocket that was considered <coughs> open container, uh, and one for joints that were somewhere in the car, but again weren't in a sealed container in the glove box, and those are two arrest in the past few days and I've been asked so I don't need an answer but if people could think on that one I mean we're pulling them out one end of the pipe and we're putting them right in the other end as far as I can tell. Do you know what county yeah. they're in by, by chance? No, no, I know. Why are they being arrested for, yeah, for possession of marijuana? Yeah, right. yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's an open container in a pocket. One was Addison, the other one was somewhere up north. <laughs> I'm not trying to point fingers at the officers, maybe this extenuating circumstances, but the last two I got yesterday yeah. from people. Those should be traffic tickets. Right. If I, that okay. So yeah. it shouldn't be an arrest, so. Okay, all right, so that's, it's a, all right, it's a ticket. It's a ticket. Right. It's, it's a, a ticket. Civil, okay. It's a civil violation. And civil. that's for like, I'm assuming that you just. Even an open container of alcohol would be. I'm assuming that's the law they're using. I just. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. traffic tickets. Okay, all right. Thanks. But fundamentally, the violation is civil, arguably, but the constitutional protections still apply, right? right. So I, I whether think, or not, um, just fun, like broadly speaking, just to give you some background, whether or not in those individual cases there's some suppression motions, hopefully if you, if you need some referrals to some attorneys, we can talk about it. Well, if, we're there for these to, me, to me, it rang a bell about the uh, turn your pockets inside out in New York City. Oh, you've got dope and, yeah. it's, and it's in, in the open, right. therefore you've now got a bigger crime. It's a nice segue into. Yeah. What right. Do you want? Are we done with this? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, just no, go, let's I, go. This is where we should be well, going. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well you, you know, the part two of our last meeting, I was sort of highlighting some of the comments from the minutes, Sheila's and Jeffrey's, and 
of where we want to go. But hey, Tom, where do you where do you see us I, guiding this? You mean right now? Yeah. This I want to hear what you're thing. saying. <laughs> all right. I'm channeling. So so I'm looking, and we all have copies of the minutes as we just approved. Data collection. Data collection. You on March 12th. Um, yeah, March 12th. Okay. March 12th. Where I'm at, and I thought that this was something, and I was here participating by phone because I went to oh, that's Waterbury. Right, you were, you went to <laughs> <laughs> and then I was not going to go to the I wish I was there, but I was there as a phone presence. Um, My sense of what we talked about, <laughs> was that Sheila came in at the end saying, I hear everyone's suggestions, but the elephant in the room that we are not squarely addressing is both sort of this pullback and recognition that our task here is to a first acknowledge readily that, that the problem here is the white supremacy inherent in the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. A. B, how are these specific proposals, narrow, big, whatever, fitting within that? I think, Jeffrey, you picked that up in right. recording your minutes saying, yes, you know, ultimately there is so much discretion, unbridled discretion effectively as to who enters the criminal justice system, police and prosecutors being at the forefront of that. Um, I wanted to just add the second part, which is, for me, I also see that as the problem, that our criminal, I wish you on this, and I didn't get a chance to weigh in in support of her specifically and to readily acknowledge that our criminal justice system is a reflection of our history. Our history being slavery and white supremacy and it's inherent. And I think it continues today with the disparities of the people impacted by our racist through historical, um, historical absorption, right, of our, our particular history that that manifests itself by racial disparities. We see it in, in the jails. We have talked as a group, sort of hearing from Rob and Joy and data. I know that there is the counter reports with Stephanie Sanguena. We can go very specific there. But ultimately, I think we have come around to the fact that the legislature has recognized there's a problem for month, tasked us to, rec to suggest specific solutions to it. Right. I see the problem as twofold in, a, in the most broadest sense. Unbridled discretion by law enforcement and prosecutors at the beginning, and where we have our implicit and <coughs> explicit biases factoring in, we know from the studies that there's discriminatory effect of that. So that comes into play. Whether or not we can neutralize whether or not it's happening at the initial stop, ultimate, or, or the, the extension of the stop, or the search, or who gets ultimately arrested, or what kinds of charges. Ultimately, we know there's a disparity of who's entering the system. The second bigger problem, unbridled, dis unbridled discretion problems, is that once folks enter the courts and then go through it, through corrections, all of a sudden we apply a race-neutral set of standards. So we can't ever get back at looking at the highly discretionary race-based implicit biases at the time of the stop. And I'm talking about our standards that we've adopted as basics in our fundamental, reasonable expectations of privacy, uh, reasonable expectations of um, suspicion of crime afoot, is all this objective uh, criteria where we strip racial bias. Now, Zulo we've talked about as a group, and in there, one of the most significant aspects of Zulo, aside from the Vermont Supreme Court recognizing a constitutional tort on violations of Article 11 of the Vermont Constitution, based on violations of your right to be, um, you know, not be subject to unreasonable search and seizure by the government, which is motivated by racial <coughs> animus. That is an interesting injection by our Vermont Supreme Court of a standard that used to be race neutral, by, but recognizing allowing racial animus into the equation. Right. Now, that's a civil side of remedies. Taking the two together, I just would suggest because this is a huge problem that we can't, I mean, I don't, I don't hope to try to solve racism in Vermont's criminal justice system overnight. But I do think that if we recognize the two big problems, and I see them as two, unbridled discretion that we should suggest to the legislature should be checked somehow. And that is in the form of law enforcement and prosecutors, form of 
discretion ideas to have what to charge, who to charge, how much to charge, and then ultimately what to ask for at the sentencing stage. And then at the court side, trying to make sure that we get standards that hold that accountability of that discretion that incorporates racial um, aspects instead of stripping um, and pretending we're in sort of a colorblind arena when it's certainly we know we're not. Wow. With a little cleaning up, we could just write that, and that would work. <laughs> you well, I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not, <coughs> you know, <laughs> has anyone read this? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I am reading it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, it's yeah. chapter three. Yeah. It's, it's chapter yeah. three. Yeah. Yeah. Right, it's, I, I, yes. I, um, it helps to articulate for me the, right. the problems that we've been seeing. Right. I just think that, I don't know. I don't know. I wish Sheila were here. Uh, she does she, too. And, and <laughs> others, but it's not like a one person driven. I just know that so much of her concern with this. I just I want to make sure that we're all on sort of that level. Um, or, or, I don't know. I hear feedback from you guys on that. I'm curious what you think. I'm, I'm glad to hear you. So everyone is right there. No, I'm not through with it. I'm not Yeah, I'm not either. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that if, if we make a recommendation on what you're saying, I think the first thing that legislators or other people will say, well, what's the solution? Right. I would say we would, I would think, in caveat with that, you would advise that either the new racial equity panel, who is responsible for helping the new executive director, whenever that person is hired, to help with those, looking into those, because they're supposed to look at the state processes and laws and everything anyway to make recommendations. Mm -hmm. Would that, with them in conjunction with the Human Rights Commission, or who, who is the proper people to, to look into this, or is it a new panel with the mm -hmm. player? I, they're gonna wanna know, okay, that's great, you recommended this, now what? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's not our job, but I would think that to be responsible, if we're going to recommend something, we should also recommend a potential avenue to look at. I, I don't know if that's if we should or not. I mean, I I, I, I was know. going I somewhere else with it. I, I I mean, I was thinking, and I'm like thinking on my feet at the moment. Um, just from listening, that one of the things we might do is sort of say, when presented with, I mean, first of all, describing what we're, t what we're talking about with unbridled discretion, and then saying, when this comes up, we would recommend that th you all stop. I mean, I, you know, I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah. stop, think, realize what the racial impact is, um, and really take that into account before just willy-nilly, well, willy-nilly, nobody does anything willy-nilly, but you know, going right ahead without thinking those things through. Um, and I think that that, there's a part of me that feels like that is a good enough description because we're not gonna be able to come up with every moment that, I'm, I mean, it's so pervasive I'm not sure how this group is going to come up with every instance in which that's going to happen. No. That's what's concerning. However, I do think there are experts out there who we could request come talk to us. Okay. And who have suggestions. And we could, as a group, because um, I think what we provide to the legislature is our, our, our diversity coming from within uh, or without the, the criminal legal system. And if we, but we don't have the expertise, no. right, individually, I was way beyond, uh, you know, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. However, there are resources where we can identify, we have funds, I think, limited funds available if, if people need transport. Uh, David just made a very strange face. He just wants a big lawsuit. Um, um, so we can't, David, get some of um, um, People who aren't employed by state government do get a stipend for travel to and from the meetings. So if we frame it as a meeting, a portion of our group would be able to get that travel. 
Okay. But I meant more of an but honorarium for a speaker to come or a consult consult, an expert to be thrown right. so in there's from there's certainly no set aside funds for that. <laughs> there would have to be a discussion. And, I see. Uh, yeah. A request to the legislature. Uh, yes. Huh. Yeah, they can make up pretty good if it's 58 cents a mile from D.C. or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I built, I have not having been here for a couple of meetings, I had sure. a check, but I mean, I think the work that was done in terms of identifying, you know, these bullet points, what they call the sequential intercept model or however you're framing them, that could be a framework to look at the question of discretion to look at each one of these categories okay. and have a conversation. And, uh, certainly experts are helpful, but mm -hmm. there's also value to talking to people who actually practice in the community to talk about, okay, how, do, how are these decisions related to these things made? And how much of it is discretionary, how much of it is unbridled, mm -hmm. um, and how much of it is actually based on parameters? Mm -hmm. And right. then talk about how to improve that is one approach that I could see, and over time, I don't think it can be done quickly, but as, as you were saying, Chief, you know, maybe the, these other panels who will continue right. to exist, can, that could be part of their function. I just see so many, like you said, when you have unbridled discretion, I mean, you, you want your law enforcement officials to have some discretion, right? Because otherwise, some of it's a judgment call, but I, I also, I've heard this from law enforcement myself, just talking, not knowing that I'm a minority myself, and just thinking that, hey, I'm just another good old boy, you know, talking that, you know, they're saying, well, if you don't want to be arrested, then don't, don't, what do you see on the news, or what do you, you know, what, then how come every time you see somebody arrested, that they're on TV with carrying drugs, or whatever, you know, you don't know the backstory behind that, but they're reinforcing their own bias by saying everybody you see on TV that's placid up that they were arrested are people of color or some other uh, lower income or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You never see anybody in a suit tie. You know, I mean, it's just, I, I think part of this goes back to not only, in my own mind, back to the education when you're first coming in, but also continuing cultural competency and collecting data like you guys were doing before trying to say that if you had three arrests on this specific charge, how many of them were, you know, X, Y, and Z, and, and try to say, and show people this is actually, you know, backs up the data that we all know is there. We're, that part of it was trying to collect data. We were looking at, I don't know if that was in your group, but collecting uh, the fair and impartial policing was trying to collect uh, data. But I think that only goes as far as you, right? It doesn't go down to the towns and the and the traffic stop data traffic. has all oh, that, okay. so CRG Robin is because the, the people I, I heard from they're they're more they weren't state they were local yeah, they, they're dumping yeah. the traffic stop data into CRG everyone has to so I mean there, I don't know the magic answer to this so I'm just saying it's but, but yeah. it's oh, yeah. good that we're, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, when we talked about collecting data so we can understand the problem, we talked about training, training whether right. citizens, we've talked about training police. I also would like to throw on the table, let's give some remedy. Mm -hmm. Let's give some immediate remedy to the person actually, who's actually been violated, who's actually been, at, you know, suffered at the hands. And remedy being something immediate for that proceeding. Remedies we are very familiar with in criminal proceedings, suppression of evidence. Dismissal of the, uh, the 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 pro proceeding. There are sample statutes out there. Something I recently dug up. Suppression. Uh, I don't. Know, is anyone are you inter familiar with the ADA? It's the pre-federal ADA version, and it's on language interpreters, but specifically hearing impairment interpreters. And there's a statute in here. I'll give you guys a site as soon as I can group this up. But it's so specific to the hearing impaired community, and it's title. Title I, BSA 338, here's what it reads, it's very short, it's admissions confessions. An admission or confession by a person who is deaf or hard of hearing made to a law enforcement officer or any other person having a prosecutorial function may only be used against the person in a criminal proceeding if the admission or confession was made knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently, not subject to alternative interpretations resulting from the person's habits and patterns and during the admission, custodial reasonable steps were taken 
to find a qualified interpreter. So this is a statute about how it's almost presumptively not, uh, can, can't be trusted the confession if you don't have a qualified interpreter mm -hmm. to navigate an interaction between a hearing impaired citizen and law enforcement or prosecutor. Now, here we have it, but it's specific to hearing impaired, not to language limited English proficiency interpreters, right? Not to anything else. I, I saw this recently in a case, and I thought, wow, this, why here? And I listened to the committee um, discussions on this. And this is an old statute, well, 1987. But my recollection was the discussion was, well, why, you know, at the end, why should we be doing this so narrowly for just this particular community? Just with hearing. And yeah. the answer was, well, let's just roll this out past this, see how it goes. We can come back and expand it later. But the constituents who proposed this mm -hmm. was, was the hearing in there. Right. And here we go and here yeah. we are. And I think very few people, if this doesn't come up, I mean, how many criminal defendants are hearing impaired who have this right? This serves as a model, a, re a model of a type of remedy that we can suggest to the legislature be mm -hmm. made available. Zulo, uh, Vermont Supreme Court, suggested a remedy based on racial animus for civil proceedings. Nothing like that exists in the criminal. Is that, am I right? Uh, so again, is sorry. there a similar remedy in criminal court proceedings related to racial animus, similar to something Suppression. It'd be suppression. Suppression, but not based on racial animus specifically. It's mostly, um, what would it, where would it be? I mean, it, if, um, if a case gets- I just remember everything I said last so I just gotta get another computer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> case gets dismissed or evidence gets just uh, suppressed based on, let's say, um, a stop based on profiling, like, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the so that's the remedy in the criminal process, and then someone could bring a civil suit. But the analysis prohibits the defense attorney from arguing the subjective motivations of the officer. Mm -hmm. We have to look at uh, from the objective right. officer in that arresting officer's position. And so that's how we have stripped out and turned into a colorblind race neutral standard. My suggestion is to specifically suggest to the legislature no, say it's actually a permissible consideration. Right. Um, so you're almost saying like that law, like you were talking about, could easily translate to migrant justice, who's not their first language and English, so they don't understand. In other words, it's not that they're hard of hearing, can't understand but they, they just don't understand without an interpreter or maybe mentally ill or whatever that might have cognitive functions that they're, they're impaired somehow so you yes. is that what you're suggesting yes I don't I, and I haven't thought it through fully through to the racial animus side of it but I'm just combining two yeah. different things certainly I think with the, the hearing impaired why not do it to the language interpreter I don't really see the same reasons to do it um, but the point back to you, Itan, is, and, and I think you were suggesting too, I, I think it's possible for us as a group collectively to come up with some specific suggestions. Okay. Even though it might obviously be far from comprehensive. I don't, I don't think there's anything novel about the idea that there's discretion on the part of the police or prosecutors. I mean, you can call it unbridled, but discretion by its very nature is can right. be unbridled. I mean, it's, it's, it's discretion. So, I, I mean, think everybody at this table recognizes that. So I'm not sure what we would present to the legislature as a recommendation of this committee, how to address that. I Judge mean, Pearson, here's an example. Articulating the basis for sus suspecting this driver of a crime, consciousness of guilt. What was the evidence that was in Dictating consciousness of guilt, nervousness, nervous behavior, sweating, looking away, running away, giving a different name. Now, let's add in some more factors. Officer's white, person who stopped is African American and female. At what point does the racial aspects to it 
cloud the officer's perspective that what that officer is thinking is consciousness of criminal guilt is actually a manifestation of total fear of the cops because they fear for their lives, right? And so back to this discretion and the stripping out of what can you consider in that reasonably, because we, but we find everything from our perspective can be argued as supportive of consciousness of guilt and suspicious activity. And it's because you can strip out the race aspect to it and all of a sudden everything is evidence of being nervous because you're hiding a guilty mind when there are lots of different reasons for it. I agree with that, except how do you challenge it at the time it's happening? The only way to challenge it that comes to my mind is in, in, in a court proceeding. Oh, I don't disagree. You're, oh, I think, I see. I'm not trying to come up with a novel procedural avenue to, to, to uh, introduce the remedy request. I'm more of what is this test to get the remedy. When you get into this. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. I, no, I mean, that's an interesting idea, how to give immediate remedy. I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> think... <laughs> <laughs> I'm open. <laughs> 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 the person in the car gets to say, I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> interpreting my fear of you <laughs> killing me as um. consciousness of guilt. <laughs> I'm going to stop to this detention, uh, and I'm open. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What about, I have an idea. What if we just, because we're not going to iron this out. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, and if I, I don't, if this is like oh, no, really. Oh, you ask me for a drafting? I do. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, know. I know, that's what happens. I, I do. <laughs> I, I'll help. How about, how about, how about um, you draft the I edit? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. And then I'm going to throw this. Okay. Okay. And then I'm, okay. And I'm going to throw this back on David. David, your minutes have to be sterling tonight. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, this, and then because I'm, I'm just thinking that what we should do. I mean, I'm listening to all of this. We're not. They're like really good arguments all around, and they're not completely reconcilable. So I'm feeling like let's write something down and then like bang it out from the standpoint of tax and just go, okay, this, no, you know, however, let's replace it with this. To start with um, working draft. Well, yeah. You have now, like, you have bullet points that people right. wrote and you have minutes from every meeting. We're, we're ready to go. Done. And so, good luck to you both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, Thank you. you have resources to yeah, put we're, language yeah. I think we do. And that, that's why I want, I, I just you know, was just sort of suggesting, right, no, let's no, go no, ahead with I, that. I, I'm happy to um, write more. I, I know, sorry. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, that's what well, we're doing. <laughs> that's what we have to do. I'll take an initial step. But, okay. We'll figure it out. Okay, okay. I'll float it. Um, is it. Can we move on to the other build that I wanted to bring up? Yes, yes Jeff. Go, uh, regarding discretion, which is the first critical part of law enforcement and a very important one, there is a disparity that's always bothered me, which is very simply a law enforcement officer can walk up to you to the window of your car and lie. That's not a crime. That's good investigative procedure and toy the academy. But if you lie in turn when you know the officer is lying to you, that's a crime. Mm -hmm. You're in violation. And that's a disparity to me. Now, if you're, perhaps if you're with your attorney and they're in the room and, and there's an investigation, people have been advised of their rights, then it's a technique. But when it's on the side of the road at 3 in the morning, I saw you cross the white line. Um, I smelled marijuana, even though it's 100 you know, degrees outside and your air conditioner is on, whatever. I think that I've always had a problem with and when you're discussing this in terms of discretion, that may be a point where discretion, to a certain extent, is being compromised. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Does that seem unreasonable? No, not to me. But um. 
No, I'm all over it. I would support repealing the false information to the police officers. <laughs> well, that's right. different. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but, uh, but you know what I'm saying. It, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. a, it's an uneven playing field. Yes. And I think it encourages some behavior, which in turn encourages disparate treatment. Uh, well, I think normally, I mean, my experience is with that, if you hear that type of case, it usually gets dumped pretty quickly, so it doesn't really see the light of day. You know, if an officer walks up and there's no evidence of video of the car crossing the center line, <coughs> and they start to go down that path, and he, I mean, we figure out that he's lying right then, those cases usually are dropped or pretty dead. They've at least, my experience, I don't know if it, others want to add in. To if they have body cameras, <laughs> they don't care, right? I mean, if we know of officers lying, I mean, I know there's a difference when you're talking about maybe, um, you know, a one-on-one -on -one interview where they're trying to kind of, you know, elicit a, um, a confession or something along those lines. That's but different. if we, but if we as prosecutors know a police officer is lying, we have a duty to disclose that right. to the defense defense bar. I think there was a case just recently in Washington County where, yep, fellow pled guilty to a charge, and I don't know how it came out right after he pled guilty, but it, it wasn't on the video, or it wasn't heard on the... It wasn't. Yeah. For some reason, after he pled guilty, the kind of, somehow the case got reopened very quickly after that, and um, the video or body cam, whatever it was, did not indicate, did not show that, that, that he had consented to the search of his car, and, but, and the police officer said, well, it, you can't hear it. But he gave me consent. So. I think I remember that. Wasn't that a marijuana and the cocaine they had? And they threw I don't remember what they had. Yeah, well, I don't know about that case, but that was there was also digger. a case in Chittenden yeah. County where an officer right. yeah. wrote in his affidavit that he had smelled marijuana when, in fact, on his body camera, he was heard, it was recorded him saying that he didn't smell marijuana mm -hmm. and he was needed to try to figure out a way to get in the car. Yeah. So. That case did go away, but it certainly wasn't their intention to have that conversation recorded, right? That part of the conversation. So, and for the record, that defendant was white, that driver was white, but um, so the only reason that got uncovered was because they accidentally recorded themselves hmm. describing illegal conduct on their own part. And which raises the concerns of how often are those conversations happening and not being recorded. Right. Right. Just to clarify, I think your point was actually more what my understanding was more what James referred to briefly, which was the investigative tech, like the trying to figure out what somebody knows, like in the course of trying to elicit a confession, where an officer is allowed to say it's something. Deceptive right? tactics. Yeah, I would. I would, yeah, I, I think you're, you're much more, my feeling is that untruths inspire untruths at the roadside, okay? And, and I don't know how to address that, and I'm, I'm not very articulate in speaking of it, but I think they do. I think um, once you start stretching the truth, then that's okay, because you're investigating at some guy's car window, some woman's car window, it's real easy to step over that line. And, if the lawyer's present or you've been advised of your rights, you might know the game. But right then, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm talking about, really, but I know what I'm feeling. Take it in. Thank you. OK. Um, 518, H518. And this will be sort of a point counterpoint because um, I, I, I hear there's there's disagreement between two of our panelists at least um, <laughs> on this. But I thought it, Gary thought it would be important to bring up too, and so it's still alive and moving around. It's here. still alive uh, on um, fair and impartial policing and minimum training standards and such. It is a part that I don't that we didn't bring here, which the HRC added an amendment on. I'm hoping David can David do a much better job of explaining all of it, which he's had to do multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, do you want me to give a... What's the disagreement? Right. Oh, the disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. They don't agree. <laughs> so. Um, so to lay the groundwork on this, this is relating to the statewide adopt the mandatory statewide adoption of a fair and impartial policing policy. Um, the original law was passed in 17. Um, is that right? I think yes. that's right. Uh, there was, it required uh, the Criminal Justice Training Council in consultation with our office and some stakeholders to uh, create a model fair and impartial policing policy which had to be followed essentially it had, all departments had to have the same elements that were in that, the same components as the word we were using, but had some flexibility to vary the language. Um, the less controversial part of that has always actually been the biased policing part of it. There's really been, that's a pretty, been a pretty uncontested aspect of this. The part that has been contested very strongly throughout is the relationship between local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities. And that's really driving the discussion on this and it's driving this bill. Um, so the initial intention of this bill was to state more clearly that, um, or I should say, you know, our viewpoint of it was to, to change the law to allow local agencies to be essentially more protective of um, information related to immigration status, citizenship and immigration status than the model policy requires. They can't be less protective, they can't be more protective of that information and it's viewed by advocate communities as uh, being more protective of undocumented workers. And so that was the primary purpose of this. There's also some um, few procedural changes that aren't really that important and it has a secondary purpose of allowing our office and the state generally to no longer have to be making representations about the federal compliance of local agencies, which we felt would be helpful in our continuing arguments with the federal government about these issues. Um, so that was the original purpose of the bill. I, I, I can characterize our disagreements <laughs> and, and the captain can correct me. I think they're twofold. One is the Department of Public Safety and Vermont State Police are worried about allowing this potentially more, this more protective language that individual agencies could adopt, uh, potentially having that impact federal grant money, which has been an ongoing dispute between the state and the federal government, and saying that yes. where local agencies may choose to go beyond the line, maybe they choose to push the push so close to the line, to go past the line of not being in compliance with federal law, that could potentially impact state money. Uh, and I think the second aspect of their points is really around consistency and saying that, arguing that it is um, helpful for the policies to be as consistent as possible so citizen, uh, citizens interacting with police agencies have similar expectations no matter who they're interacting with. Um, and our office has felt that with the funding issue, we don't feel that the funding of local agencies is going to affect the funding issue, I should say, the policies of local agencies are necessarily going to affect state funding. Right. I should say clearly we don't think that that's going to be the case and I won't bore you too much with the details of that argument but I'm happy to get into it if you want. Um, and we also felt that because the baseline of the model policy is very high in terms of how protective it is of undocumented individuals including saying you won't ask about it unless it's necessary to an investigation uh, and really writing up, we tried to write the policy very close to the what's federally allowable in terms of really trying to be protective. Uh, so we didn't feel like the average citizen is going to feel a big difference in their interaction with agencies. So that's sort of, that's the a characterization of the back and forth between our offices and generally speaking about what this bill does. Obviously immigration issues um, and un work issues around undocumented workers are not necessarily also race related, but as a practical matter, we all know that oh, yeah. we generally are. <laughs> uh, and that's obviously underlying uh, this argument. Right. As well. oh, just a question. So you're, I understand the fact that you don't go out and try to find illegal immigrants, or if you're uh, 
you're, you're trying to separate, in other words, you're not going out seeking for that. But are you asking with this bill that law enforcement don't enforce law? I'm asking the question because because that basically, I know there's a separation of power between what immigration is supposed to do at a federal level and what local law enforcement is supposed to do. But if they do find that someone is illegal, what what is this bill? Are you saying ignore it or are they saying, just, I, I'm asking the question. Yeah, no, no, that's a fair question, understand. man. That's getting to the heart of the issue. The okay. policy, as it already exists, has a bunch of parameters around what the local agencies can and can't do as a relationship to the federal government. All this is really saying is you, you local agency, you can be more, you can have requirements that are more protective around that information. I will say that the policy does not forbid, and because it cannot forbid in accordance with federal law, it does not forbid a local officer, um, or I should say an agency officer, making a phone call to federal authorities about uh, citizenship or immigration status, because that's explicitly what the federal law says we cannot forbid. Um, but it does say, you know, you're, you're not going to ask about it unless it's necessary to a criminal investigation, which is likely to be in a very narrow set of cases, like a human trafficking case or something like that. Um, and it also says that information outside of citizenship or immigration status won't be shared unless there is some specific public safety need to communicate. Um, so there are sort of strict parameters, but uh, that communication is not forbidden by the policy. So uh, things I would add is that we had two million dollars held up, and that's that money was uh, opiate funding, task force members, and the way we kind of look at it is that numbers right there are what we're looking at of opiate deaths, and problems, and all these other contributing factors. This is a big pot of money for us to not have, and. Uh, and we still haven't had our certification signed off going to this point of where this is. So there's, there's and the federal government is not giving clear guidance on what can happen with this. So it just creates confusion, no. concerning. It's, we're concerned about that. And so this seems like if we work so hard to get the fair and impartial policing policy to be adopted last year, now here we are again trying to like do something different to it. And it just is going to, we, we're already seeing difficulties of implementing the current policy. We didn't, the legislator cut all the funding to have training, so agencies haven't trained. It took a little bit of time for agencies to adopt the policy. So I think there's just confusion, especially for the troopers or the people on the ground doing the work of having this policy <coughs> change I don't know, four times in about four years. So that is, it, it, I mean, don't quote me that statement, but it's been difficult to sort of get consistency and understanding of this, because this is, it's difficult for people to understand the federal law, what that means when you're coming in contact with the person uh, who is a re who's lived in the state but doesn't have maybe legal status and what they can and can't do with that. It's just it's, it's confusing. What would be confusing anyway in my mind is that you're asking law enforcement officer to uphold the law, but yet go wink, wink, turn your head. If it's, you know, how yeah, they it's, find out if somebody's actually illegal. I mean, I'm just saying that's kind of a contradiction of, what you're being taught. I mean, but anyway, I mean, I'm probably the wrong person to be into this conversation <laughs> because we know what happened with immigration with us. Um, it didn't go so well for me and our people. Mm -hmm. but, um, I I'm think just, broadly speaking, the question is illegal and yeah. what is it and what are, what's the mandate and what are, you know, resources are tight all mm -hmm. around. So what should law enforcement in Vermont be focused on? Agree. And so that's where, and I'm just giving you. <laughs> no, I, I agree. You shouldn't be out there searching for it. But I'm just saying is I'm just wondering what happens if you find it. That's all I'm saying. That's where right. I was wondering right. if, where this bill would be, may or may not be. That's going into the discretion again. Yeah, and again, those num right. and like the numbers right there. Yes. What, what? No one has brought up calls that I'm aware of. Right. being around ups. It come, more often than not, it comes up during the course of an arrest. Now this person is arrested, and then the information comes out during that process. Like the incident then again. that's where immediately confusion starts with the officer is, do I call or don't I call? What level of crime is this really? Is it, you know, 
a D, uh, DUI one, or is this yep. a, you know, or, or, you know, so that, that just, it, it creates a massive amount of confusion. Yeah, the only reason why I was asking is I remember that uh, there was a time where the federal government was asking people to seek out and right. find people right. where the state had said, we're not going to do that. Yeah. Um, there was a big uh, controversy about taking funding. I'm sure it's a complicated question, but they denied or held back $2 million? Yes. And the, what's the rationale for it? They considered the entire state to be sort of that sanctuary state, for lack of a right. better term, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, they are arguing that the model, that, that the policies that are being followed by state police and, and um, because that's really the agency that they are looking at, they're scrutinizing for state funding because they're the, the vector for that funding, uh, is out of compliance <coughs> with federal law. And the argument in return is, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> no, really? Is there a suit? Is there some... We are not presently involved in litigation involving Vermont's money. But they do. I mean, when we get funds from the Department of Justice, we have to also certify certain things to them as well. So, you know, and that's sort of the same position that the state police would be in. I think they also have a problem with that too, right? right. Because, yeah. they, because they are considered a sexually city. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just one sort of overall policy point about it, I think the policy idea behind this, the immigration sections of the fair and partial policing policy is really <coughs> to make sure that people who need the help of law enforcement services won't be afraid to call for those services. Right. Yeah. Because that's the sort of baseline obligation for law enforcement, just keeping right. people safe and cure victims have a place to go to. And that's why you're trying to make sure, and separating out these two policy initiatives. One is a federal run around immigration priorities, and the other one is the state's basic obligation to keep people safe. Um, and then as a policy point, I would just note that this doesn't mandate any change to anybody's policy. And I'm, I find it unlikely <laughs> that this, the model policy is going to <coughs> change subsequent to this. Um, yeah. And the second part, the HRC part, you could put. Oh, yeah, so there's also been a proposal from HRC um, to basically give themselves the authority with short notice, I think the proposal 48 right now is 48 hours. hours, to search the records of any law enforcement entity <coughs> to out fair and impartial policing policies um, to make sure that they have the right policy and they're in compliance in terms of training and, and so on and so forth. That has been a point of contention. Um, I mean, if it's an active investigation, that's a problem, right? Yes, and the, the legislative language that just came out does carve out active investigations as those can't be the subject of this review. Um, but I think law enforcement has very serious concerns about closed investigations where perhaps people weren't charged with something and now that material is going to be exposed to somebody else. Um, so there's a lot of concerns about that. There's sort of a compromise proposal that's on the table also that just says we're going to make the complaint process more clear and transparent when you do have concerns about fair and partial policing but not actually change the enforcement mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, so one of those two, that's going to be considered tomorrow morning actually and we'll see huh? what happens with that. Anything else or? Okay. Are you asking for us? Are you just we just reviewing this? Or are you asking? I'm just this? I'm just at, I'm just okay. reviewing. I'm just putting it in front of people. If if it inspires you, as 460 did, uh, um, great. But no expectation. I have a question for Gary. Did we? Uh, I know as part of your stuff, you were looking at gathering more data from tickets or other things. Did that, I mean, I haven't, I'm sorry, I haven't been to some of those meetings. Um, did they actually start collecting more data or more consistent data? That's going to be coming up, so I actually got an email about that today. We're, the state is moving towards the e-ticket, sort of electronic ticketing, which is going to allow more windows on, on the computer program. It doesn't allow it on the paper form. So that's the okay. complicated part of it. If we're, you could still always have the option to fill out a paper ticket. 
and you want to have all these other options in the back. So we're trying to navigate that still, but hopefully the back end is uh, we want to add the passenger searches, and you know, so that's usually a confusion um, on the paper ticket if they search the car, but it's really the passenger that's been searched was getting bad data because mm -hmm. it's really not the operator that's being searched, but we're getting checked off as the operator, and you see that time and time again. That's not. So there's just, it's not consistently being filled up. So the hope is that we can now start to clarify if it's a passenger search, search or an operator search and where does it lead to arrest, uh, ticket, civil violation, you know, things like that. And it's still self-declaring of people's race? Because I know one time the officer was it's perception. making a perception. It's, it's perception. It's officer it's, perception. I remember at one point they were saying it might be an option to fill out, not if somebody would want to, but fill yeah. out the race. that. No, we wouldn't, we're not going to do that. Okay. So are you saying by the e-ticket that you're bringing in that that means that all the data in there are going to be shared or only that it provides the opportunity of more data? At the end of the, hopefully yeah. at the end of the process, everything will be dumped into this, the, the, everything would be shared, whatever happens on the back on of that ticket. E ticket. So currently that's what happens. If it's in theory and the hope, yeah. <laughs> right, if it's being filled out properly, but everything that's filled out is dumped into the CRG website. That's you know, and that's the other side of that, making sure that's ac accurate. Other, you know, we do a, a very good. We have a woman that's really into it. She does a process of making sure everything's accurate. A local agency doesn't have the resources to do that, yeah. so they're just seeing all kinds of errors in there, duplication. The judicial bureau is the first part of our system, beginning actually in another month to have the electronic file. So oh. um, all of that information will be more accessible. We'll have more. Is now. Yeah. Good. I have a, that. another question if people don't mind me asking questions. But uh, uh, I know that part of the fair uh, policing policy is just cultural competency and training. You hammer that home a lot. That's made some changes. So I guess my other question is does do prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, anybody in the Corrections, are any of those departments required to kind of take the same intensive training like they would do at the training academy or other thing that might help change the, you know, to educate people? I mean, is that something, if they don't, is that something we should recommend that, I mean, it's not just like something you take online for an hour. It, it's an actual, uh, you know, something that they go to the academy to actually have the training or have somebody <laughs> come out. And, and train them. It's I agency agency specific it's for police too. Some agencies there's no funding right. for it other than at the academy and initial. Understand? Weapon, yeah. So. But but I was I guess if we're trying to change the perception all the way down the line from arrest to uh, you know defense attorneys and prosecutors and and all of this corrections on the back end. And, I mean, wouldn't you think that it might help if they have the cultural competency training? that you might have on the front line to make these discretionary um, judgments because if they are if they do have inherent bias if they've never had a, a education on why that might be the, the fact they might go oh I don't re I didn't realize I mean I, I was just asking because I know it does work because when I I mean not to get off topic but I came from Vermont which is pretty white my first duty station and my basic training was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I was pretty immersed in cultural competency. So I'm saying, but it makes your perceptions change about everything because you're, you're around about different that. cultures. I mean, you're getting the training, but no, I, no, I no. happen to get it firsthand, but I'm talking about education reasons. You're talking about implicit bias training? I, any yeah. training that has to do with cultural competency, implicit bias, I mean, culture, whatever. I mean, I, I was asking the question because I'm not in mm -hmm. where you are, if you guys are required to take those trainings. Mm -hmm. Well, for instance, this June, we have an annual judicial college where actually I asked Karen Richards to come in and uh, mm -hmm. speak to all of the judges uh, in a session. Um, and I think Anna has reached out mm -hmm. to someone uh, under sort of defense attorneys meet at the same, roughly the same time we do, and I understand they're bringing someone in. Um, they wanted us to join with them on that person. We had already committed to Karen Richards, so um, I think all of us are aware of the issue and trying to 
get as much training to <coughs> Right, but that's on your own. I guess my right. question is when we're re making recommendations to right. the legislators or for changes, should that be a requirement? You know, almost like a yeah. continuing ed kind of sure. you are required as part of... So we do have continuing education requirements to yeah. remain active members mm -hmm. of the bar, the Vermont bar. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why these trainings get scheduled every summer, you know, a few times a year. Um, and I but right now, that's not a to you, right now, like the topics that we cover are totally up to us, right? Like right. we have a training director who comes up with a theme for the, you know, this, this year's training or whatever. Um, so I do think that a lot more, I mean, implicit bias is a topic, you know, I mean, it's, people are becoming more aware of it, but it is, to your point, not a requirement of any type of training. And I don't know exactly what it would look like, but the general idea that you're making right now, I completely agree with. That, Maybe like, be, right? that, yes, that there should be some sort of, um, sort of required ongoing, you know, whether it's every other year or whatever, training right. in a lot of different areas of the criminal justice system. Um, Rebecca and I actually talked to Stephanie. So Stephanie Segrino is the, is the person who's going to come, I think, now to our training this summer. And she was recently telling us that she had been um, brought on as an expert in a criminal case to testify at hearing, was it the sentencing hearing? I think it was a sentencing hearing in a case with a black defendant. I forget what county it was in, but a black defendant, and his lawyer was white, the judge was white, the prosecutor was white, like every, you know, probably the law enforcement officers who investigated the case were white. And so um, she was brought in as an expert to talk about this bias, I guess, and, um, and the judge sort of asked her, okay, I hear what the problem is, but what's the remedy? And one of her, part of her answer was that implicit bias needs to be called out <coughs> as contemporaneously to when it's happening as possible. So certainly training is not necessarily contemporaneous to when things are happening, but if it's an ongoing process, that may be as close as we're gonna it's, get, right? right? I mean, I could even see that being beneficial in your department because there's so many uh, cultural differences with children. In their culture, it may not be bad. In our culture, it may not be desirable. And then all of a sudden, somebody calls and they say, "Oh, you just did this, and oh, that's against our laws." And no. you know, I mean, you run into that probably with Ruski and Rosen all the time. But but I'm just saying that, that I can see this type of mandatory training, a good recommendation. And I just we, yeah, no. go ahead. Just from a legal standpoint, to make it clear, it is not mandated for anybody other than people who exercise law enforcement authority, right. which is not the agency, I mean, I should say not the departments or things like that. So um, like right. DOC wouldn't be part of that, right. um, or our office wouldn't be part of that. Uh, so no. to your point, no, it's not part of it. It's not in the law right now. I think that's an interesting idea. Well, it is part of what the other group is supposed to be looking at, because I believe that an executive part of that statute said that that training would have to be across state government. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'll point out, because I work with social workers all the time, is that actually what my people tell me is that training has, and it sort of goes to the point that you were making, Suzanne, training has limited applicability, you know? Right. But coaching um, is something that actually can be much more valuable. Um, and it's harder to mandate, to be honest, but just to make that point is that there is value to um, things like mandatory training, but it's also worth thinking about um, uh, actually having the contemporaneous approach is recognizing that coaching can be ongoing and that we have to build a capacity to do those kind of things within our organizations, both to identify but also to be able to support people to uh, Which goes to a forward. point that you made maybe in the lab or whatever the a recent, one of the recent meetings where you were at, there, I think it's been bold in the minutes that you talked about the 12th hour um, about different agencies being mandated to have a person identified right. as yep. maybe right. this in this type of role mm -hmm. in their agency. Can, can I? Yeah, sure. If if it's quick, 
Well, I, my question was, uh, are, are you suggesting like an implicit bias um, training and or coach or a cultural awareness education? Everything. Or both. I guess <laughs> all of the above. My question is, this panel is charged with trying to make a difference in, in criminal juvenile justice, at least specifically. I mean, but I'm saying is, we have a unique opportunity to not only maybe mandate where we can, but highly suggest in other areas that the legislators, because it's such a topic right now with systemic racism and there's the panel and there's other people looking at it, that we at least put it on their radar because I, I think part of what that, uh, the reason why I'm making this, uh, I'll try to make it quick, but part of this big packet that I gave you is they're saying we should look at it at every facet mm -hmm. of the criminal justice system. I'm saying is if that's not mandatory now, why not? Because if it's making a difference with the state police, why wouldn't it make a difference in the rest of the justice system or beyond? Uh, if we want to change the direction of what's happening. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But anyway, I'm sorry, you want to well, I'm just I'm just coming at it from a different perspective and sort of just sharing because I think you know the Department of Corrections is does a lot of training around culture, but in a different capacity, right? So a lot of the things that we focus on first are gender, gender responsive trauma, um, lots of conversations about women's pathways to violence, um, uh, safety for the LGBTQ community. So there's a lot of that that gets talked about very much at our Corrections Academy and then reinforced through through training and then we we don't have to the degree that the, the State Police Academy has um, you know a whole section on implicit bias but what we're looking at is where do we take all of that work and bring it into the work that we're already doing and, and make it just sort of foundational across all of the stuff we're teaching at the academy. Yeah, and that's kind of the way that we're thinking about doing it. No, it's gotta be quick. Yeah, no, I got. I really got it. I really got to move us along. I've got it. I'm sorry. Um, the real, the important thing that I really wanted to get done with this meeting, and this, I'm sorry to cut the conversation off, but there were three people who were not at the last meeting who were not able to participate in that collaborational discussion around the bullet points that we had that I at least found very, very <coughs> fruitful and productive. And that was Monica and Ken and Judge Pearson. And I would like, we only have half an hour left. And so I really want to give you three in particular an opportunity to weigh in on this, particularly because, and I'm just skipping a little ahead here on the agenda, um, we're probably not going to meet next month. The plan that I have in my head is I'm going to start drafting and I'm going to send things to you by email. There's no reason for everybody to be driving all over Vermont. Beautiful state, enough already. <laughs> um, and so I will just start. I think we're done with the sleep, though. Fine. Right. <laughs> so we could do I, I, we may be done. I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, jump to any conclusions. I wasn't going to be here in May anyway. So. Oh, well, this, here we are. Can I so, just that quickly say, though, scheduling-wise, June is going to be a problem um, because I, I think the week that this meeting would be is the week of all these um, trainings, trainings that the defense bar and the judges and the prosecutors all schedule every summer. So. Well, hmm. Hmm. I'm going to just think about things okay. then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for putting that out. I can't like come up with a good answer right no, now. You don't but, need to um, but, but thank you. Um, I'll, we'll think of something. But anyway, I just want to put that out there. But that's why I want to move us along right now because I want to hear from these three people so we can actually move everything that we're doing as a panel forward. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Ken, do you want to start? Sure, I don't mind. So as I looked at this and thought about it, my world's a little different because I'm not in the criminal justice, it's juvenile justice, which some certain things are definitely comparable and transferable, but other things are quite different. So as I looked at this, though, of course, many of the principles are certainly the same. So so youth, I mean, and I mean, I'm 
youth who get involved with law enforcement for delinquent acts, um, I think the issues are probably all the same. Um, and so the reality would be to whatever extent that there is interaction between law enforcement and, for example, the courts, my department, um, I think the, the, the kind of things we're talking about in terms of implicit bias, making sure that um, we do have appropriate training and, and decision making, um, all I think are comparable. Um, for me, uh, to, to cut to the chase, I think the, the most concerning aspect of our system in terms of juvenile justice, in terms of disparities, has to do with detention, and particularly in Woodside, um, mm -hmm. in that it is disconcerting to walk into that building and see the um, high numbers uh, of people of color. And so um, it's, it's definitely, uh, we've done some things, to be clear, in terms of looking at that system. Um, and so uh, the, the law was changed a couple of years ago to make it clear that um, decisions with respect to um, whether or not a youth would be detained at Woodside um, is actually now up to the judge. Uh, at the predisposition phase, whereas it used to be a little bit fuzzier in terms of who made that decision. Um, going back to the earlier conversation, um, right. the, the discretion is pretty broad, um, to be candid. Um, it's, not, it's not like bail in the juvenile system. It's more whether or not the youth would be at risk of harm to themselves or others. So it is arguably broader. But one of the things that was included in the statute um, and this goes back to the control issues that we talked about a little bit mm -hmm. later before the meeting started, is even if a judge um, orders a youth to go to Woodside, um, the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families actually has the discretion to um, allow that youth to be placed at an alternative spot if we think that the youth can be uh, safe and um, not risk of harm to self or others, so that we have actually some discretion to move the youth out of Woodside, which, which is, has some value in terms of mm -hmm. trying to manage that. We do have some tools that we use with respect to who should be at Woodside. Some, there's a lot of research around the country, because this has been um, in the youth systems around the country, disparate um, uh, uh, minority confinement is a major problem um, of substantial degree, and having objective instruments is oftentimes uh, a way to try to deal with that problem, and we're working with UVM to develop um, some instruments for here. But so I think for me that's one of the um, issues of concern. The other thing we've done is um, through an, an entity that's affiliated with DCF, the um, Children and Family Council for Prevention Programs, which gets some federal money. We've given a grant to the Association of Africans Living in Vermont to try to develop some approaches to work with families and young people to try to address issues up front as from a prevention approach to try to avoid the need for detention. Um, frankly, I think we need to do um, some work to have that be more effective, but that, that's one of the approaches we've taken to try to address that issue. Um, and I think that um, from our perspective, I th we clearly have some more work to do in that arena. Um, and so, you know, that doesn't, it, it, because the system is different, um, it doesn't quite fit neatly into mm -hmm. the, these bullet points, but I do think it's a detention issue. And to that extent, um, is definitely very relevant and I think um, is something that we need to continue working on from my perspective. Um, and so I think for me, that's the biggest issue that, that I would identify. I mean, based on the, the data that we've seen, some of the disparity actually does tend to even out um, once you get to actual disposition, meaning the disposition phase is somewhat akin to sentencing for those of you familiar with the system. But again, it's not, a, it's not based on an allegation related to the crime. It's, it's again related to whether or not the youth um, needs to be in state custody or not. Um, and then it could, because more often than not, um, the, the, the decision is actually not state custody. One of the things that actually is good in Vermont with respect to delinquencies is actually those are continuing to go down. Um, the percentages of kids coming into custody for delinquencies, even with adding 16 and 17 year olds, again, without getting into the weeds, um, that had, was used to be more discretionary. Now all of those are primarily in the youth system the numbers of delinquent kids in custody is going down, so that's a good thing. Um, and actually, again, just to mention it, 18 and 19 year olds, the legislature has decided that in coming years, those are gonna be in the family court system, not the adult 
criminal system. And so I, I think it's another area, though, that we're going to have to be mindful of to make sure that issues related to, to um, implicit bias and disproportionate um, minority involvement in the system, we need to make sure that as the age group increases in terms of the family court system, that we're mindful of those issues. Mm -hmm. So I'll sort of stop there, but open to questions or comments. Um, am I right, though, in saying, <coughs> oh, the court can now uh, place someone in uh, Woodside if it requires a recommendation? Yes, that's the other piece. Thank you. Right. I appreciate it. So that's right. So that was the other safeguard that was put into place. So. Um, in fact, if, if uh, DCF recommends that a youth be placed in a community-based program or with their family, then the judge can't place the kid in Woodside. So we've done a variety of things. And again, obviously, that's not limited to just issue of race. It's just generally speaking to try to utilize Woodside to the least extent necessary. You got that down, David? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like totally paranoid now. It's like, did you write that comma down? <laughs> Monica, do you want to? Sure. Um, just looking through the notes that I had. It seems like so long ago. One of the things that, about this report, and I, I know everybody knows this, but I just did, wanted to say this, is that they took each of these sections that were related to like probation, parole, Reentry, incarceration, and broke it out as if there were different organizations overseeing them. Because in a lot of states, that's actually accurate, and that's not true in Vermont, yeah. right? So, all of those categories, like they repeated themselves a little bit in terms of the recommendations they made, and all of those things are things that the Department of Corrections is responsible for doing in terms of the supervision. So, there's some other funky legal things that happen around parole in terms of approbation in terms of who's the accountable violating authority, judiciary, parole board, corrections. And that gets into this concept of legal statuses. And we've been talking about legal statuses um, a fair amount at the legislature, David and the Commissioner of Corrections around the disparity that actually exists between people on furlough and people who are on parole in terms mm -hmm. of you know the way they get violated. And so those are some things that we're working on. I didn't write this in this report that I originally submitted because this is kind of new, but it's making me think about the fact that these are some things that could contribute Great. to disparities. And these are things that we're going to be working on over the next few years anyway. The legislature is pretty much told us we need that, but I'm just sort of sharing that because um, I think it's related to this um, um, because all of those things are like legal statuses. Um, I know we've talked about collecting data a lot and um, reporting data, and since I'm usually on the, at least from a correction standpoint, the receiving end of those requests and having to report them. I just think it's fair to acknowledge that the capacity and resources within a lot of organizations to accurately correct, uh, collect, and report outbound data is really, really small. And so if we want to do that, I think we have to think about a way of also recommending that there is some resource around. Resource in terms of making it possible, or? like people or money, right? Right. Because, right. <laughs> or both. <laughs> or, both. <laughs> or, or, or both, right? right. Yeah. Ideally, it would yeah. be like a neutral. Yeah, I'm right. right. sure. Right. I mean, that's somebody I though who has the, the state capacity. Of Vermont completely right. collecting all the data. <laughs> right. You know, how to do statistics? Right. All these things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But I think that, you know we talk about that, but it's it you know to have like a small law enforcement organization have to be responsible for that, and then I mean people would think that a Department of Corrections could have a lot of that capacity, but in fact we really don't in terms of the people power. Okay. Um, anyway, that's totally okay. different. That's um, good to know. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important for us when we talk about data to really think about that. Um, Somebody has to do it. It doesn't magically right. <laughs> appear. It's not our dream of um, I think it also might be interesting to, um, if 
the group wanted to talk about things that are in place in Vermont that are already potentially in line with this mm -hmm. report. So some of the things that I noted were the fact that, at least in the correction system, we do use a graduated sanction system. We do use um, objective risk assessments tools. We have a very clear uh, grievance process that's defined in our um, directives. Um, and we do access a lot of resources from professional associations. And we're always looking at best practices from across the country to try and I think it'd be important to acknowledge that. Um, also, you know, agree with everyone that um, more training is important, and we acknowledge that we we definitely think that training is important. Um, so I, I would not object to that at all. But that also usually requires a resource. Yeah. Um, and that we also need to think about our staff recruitment, because that was one of the things that the other report really talked about. It's like, how do you recruit staff and bring staff in so that your staff are diverse and representative and that sort of kind of, and for the past few years, we've really worked in the with the Department of Human Resources on some recruitment strategies to broaden our recruitment efforts. Um, our focus right now is quite honestly is on female correctional staff, mm -hmm. because that's where we have uh, a pretty big gap in terms of being able to have diversity. Um, but we're definitely working out in that area. So, you know, that was sort of a different take on, on, on this whole report when I, when I was looking at okay. Any questions? Thank you. Do you have anything that you want to? You, you know, wrote me that wonderful email that was so succinct. <laughs> um, you know, I, the the email. I, I don't know if you shared it with me. I have it yet. No. So I, I think I can sum it up pretty. Quickly. I have it. I, I looked at um, you know the other comments by folks and, and obviously the the courts. Biggest areas of the exercise of discretion um, are at, uh, at the beginning of the process, at, at arraignment, at bail, setting bail or not setting bail, conditions of release, um, and on the back end of that, at sentencing. Um, there have been a couple of studies done in Vermont, uh, primarily by CRG, um, on sentencing, and I can't say they've been extensive, but they have not, at least the studies that have been done have not um, demonstrated or, uh, evidence of, of bias in sentencing. Right. Um, I think one of the factors, and I'll get into it a little bit later, is um, one of their studies talked about the impact of out-of-state criminal records uh, and, and the difference that that can make, uh, yeah. at least in their statistics. Um, but before we get to, to the sentencing phase, the detainee population for whatever reason, over 10 years or more that I've been involved in the system, remains fairly constant. It's about 380 to 400 people every day. And that uh, number, uh, I know the, the department, uh, every once in a while does a snapshot. Uh, I know we did one, I think it was last fall. Um, there were about 400 people in there, mm -hmm. uh, almost half were being held without bail. The other uh, greatest number was uh, serious felonies uh, held on bail. And the numbers for misdemeanor or, or non-violent offenses generally run about 20 to 30 right. people every time they take a snapshot. Right. Um, and there's one here, I think it was January 9th this year. Um, there were 22 misdemeanor, they classify them as misdemeanor persons, um, meaning personal, involved personal offenses. Twelve of those, more than half of them, were domestic assaults. Um, so then if you take away those twelve, you're down to, you know, less than twenty misdemeanors. And you, even that population, you cannot tell why they're being held unless you drill down into the individual case. And by that I mean somebody could be on 
furlough status, they could go out and they could be in a, a go into a store and grab a bottle of beer or something. They're held on a, a petty larceny charge or a new charge. When they come into court, uh, they're probably going to be held on 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 furlough violation anyway. So we they're not going to be released. Right. Um, but somebody will say, um, well, let's set fifty dollars bail. So they're getting credit. Excuse on me. The new just charge. reminded that we close at eight o'clock. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'll pick up the pace. Uh, so <laughs> you, you really have to look at, at the individual offenses um, because some of them are, they, there's a very, historically, there's a very small population of nonviolent uh, misdemeanors. Right. Um, and, and that population, as far as I know, there's never been a study done of, of, of bias. I do know that. Senator Sears and some other folks um, are, are probably going, they've been talking about the detained population a lot in this session. There are many bills now that are addressing it. But there's, it, going, there's going to be it, There's going to be some. Um, we met recently a, a group of us that uh, I expect that yes. discussion probably to start in earnest this summer okay. and maybe lead to something then. But um, That would be interesting. You know, it, we've talked all of this at different times about data. And I was struck by uh, Gary's comment um, that in identifying uh, race, it's perception. And I think as important as the data is, and we need more of it, we need better data, we really have to have in mind the source of the data that people are looking at. In other words, if you look at court data, we do very little of independent data gathering. In other words, we're relying on the information that comes from the police and then comes through the state's attorney's office with a file. We're just putting that into our system. It's not as if you're not do. making a judgment. It, exactly. Right. And so that data is critical, um, but you have to look at, at the source of it. And right. Going back to the sentencing piece, uh, I think CRG felt that um, out-of-state records were a significant factor, or could be. And I, I think, and I mentioned it in, in my email, I think it's important because by the time these cases get to us at the back end right. of sentencing, 95% of the cases that come before us have plea agreements between the defense and, and the state that are presented to judges. And yes, we can reject those agreements. Um, it's usually not done very often. Uh, at that point in the process, the state and the defense have a much better understanding of the facts and the strengths and weaknesses of a case. Maybe a victim reluctance in wanting to testify. Any number of reasons why they're presenting that to us. Um, but one of the factors in the sentencing can be someone's out-of-state record. Mm -hmm. And as you talked, Jeff, about the process in New York City, um, all we're seeing is a conviction for some offense out of New York, or Jersey, uh, or wherever, Pennsylvania. We don't know what goes into that record. It may, in fact, be one of these cases where a stop and frisk uh, without justification led to an arrest, led to a detention in New York. They're only going to sit in jail so long before they plead guilty just to get out right. because of the demand. But that is a record that then comes to us right. at the beginning and is a factor in setting bail, which can be a factor in detention. So I think we really have to look at that data and, you know, how do we separate the good data from the bad. Right. Um, Rebecca. Oh, hi. Del Pozo, did you see Chief Del Pozo's recent data report on bail in Chittenden County? I just and got it. It, and I it reveals there's a racial disparity treatment. Um, but it's an interesting point on how and which data we should be looking at. Okay, good. I'm glad you have that. Rebecca, where did I just you see I didn't. I had a chance. Uh, the chief, uh, Del Pozo. You gave it to me. I'll give it to Rebecca. I could share it with the group yeah. for sure. Oh, I'd be really I, interested I, in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's fine. I was just curious. <laughs> if, like, if no, I'm just curious if it's something he put out or if it was just like something he was just keeping track of. Gave it to me and he didn't tell me that I couldn't share it. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think it's been distributed yeah, to any number of people. Okay. It just came out within the last three or four days. I, I know. I heard it just came out like he released something like publicly, but you're saying he's handed something out to people. Well, Internal, uh, confidential. Okay. No. <laughs>
Well, but yeah, it's I an don't interesting. Feel it's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's a reflection, though, that there and just and Dr. Stephanie Sanguino's data certainly countering CRG's <coughs> reporting. Certainly, there are different intr like results out there. I just wanted to share that. Or, yeah, it'd be interesting to look at. I would. Yeah. I'd like to see it. Yeah, probably. I mean, that would be. Thank you. Thanks. I'd be. I'd be interested too. It's based on you saying there's not enough resources. I work with UVM quite often in that they have they have a whole department that collects data for the state, whether it be census data, all kinds of data. They use it for community service block grants. They, I mean, they're contracted by the state, I believe, to do to gather all kinds of data. I'm not sure if they if during the census if they collect data. I think it'd be really data. important to have a conversation <laughs> just about. I mean, not to get really detailed, but about how data is collected, different systems of right. data, and why just ha and why having an external organization to say, mm -hmm. oh, I'll come in and do it for you, is also equally extremely difficult. Yeah, they won't and, really and, and well, no, not even that. I'm li literally talking just from the actual like <clears throat> logistics of it, um, and not that we would be opposed to it, but I think everybody's got their own system yeah. for collecting it and yes. understanding it and pulling it out, which it usually is more complicated than it should be, in my opinion. It's complicated. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate getting something from everybody, because I really wanted to hear from everybody before I started this task. Um, I will do the best I can. It's not going to be, you know, William Blake, but I will do my best. Um, I, as I say, we won't meet on the 14th of May, which would be our normal time to meet because I've really got to start doing this. If I'm not in touch, it's not that I'm not thinking about it or doing, it's that I'm doing. You're doing, doing. And, um, Feel free to be in touch. I will be in touch as soon as I can.